Critical Thinking Rule 1 – Resolve Premises and Conclusion An argument is one or more propositions given as proof of or evidence for another proposition. This can also be called an inference. Critical thinking is focused on analyzing and evaluating arguments to understand their structure and to see how effective they are. An argument is made up of propositions. A proposition is a type of sentence. It's one that's true or false, or that has a truth value, as we say in logic. A proposition can also be called a statement. The word proposition, though, refers to the underlying meaning of a statement. A statement represents the series of words in a particular language that expresses the proposition. This distinction is sometimes useful because the same proposition, the same claim about the world, can sometimes be put into different wording and that would count as different statements. For example, the same proposition can be expressed in multiple languages and it would be a different statement in each language. The argument on the right is an example argument often given by logic professors. All humans are mortal. Socrates, the famous ancient Greek philosopher, is human. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. What an argument is trying to do is prove one of the propositions. The proposition that the argument is trying to prove is called the conclusion can also be called a thesis. The other proposition or propositions in an argument are the premises. Those are the propositions given as proof of or evidence for the conclusion. Premises can also be called assumptions because they're things that you assume as true in order to prove the conclusion. In this example, the conclusion is Socrates is mortal and the premises are all humans are mortal and Socrates is human. There are some strategies for identifying premises and conclusion. Number one, what is the author trying to get you to believe? That's the conclusion. The conclusion is the main point of the argument. In the meme on the right, I don't know, therefore aliens, even though it's not a fully fleshed out argument, the conclusion is indicated by the word therefore. So the conclusion is gonna be something about aliens, such as aliens built the pyramids. This meme suggests an actual argument that's a fallacy called the argument from ignorance. The argument from ignorance fallacy or bad argument form starts from a premise that asserts a lack of knowledge. In this case, I don't know, or we can't prove that. And then tries to conclude with the definite claim, the aliens built the pyramids or something like that. This is a fallacy or a bad argument form because you can't logically prove a definite claim or proposition from a lack of knowledge. If you don't know how the pyramids were built, that just shows that you don't know how the pyramids were built. You can't use that as evidence for a particular builder. And by the way, uh, scientists do know how the pyramids were built, but that's a separate issue. A second strategy is what reasons or evidence does the author give? Those are the premises. Sometimes there isn't a lot of indicator words given that flag premises or conclusion. So you have to look at the meaning of the propositions that are given. The propositions that can be used as proof of or evidence for another, those are the premises. And the proposition that can be proven, that's the conclusion. Thirdly, look for the indicator words. There's two types, premise and conclusion indicators. Premise indicators include words such as because, since, given that, for or on the grounds that. Because and sense are the two most common premise indicator words. Not all arguments have indicator words, but when they're there, you should be able to recognize them. Conclusion indicators include words such as therefore or thus. Those are the two most, most common. Other conclusion indicators are hence, so, consequently, because of this or for this reason. Notice the seeming similarity between just the word because, which is a premise indicator, and because of this, which is a conclusion indicator. When the word because occurs alone before a proposition, it's a premise indicator. When the whole phrase because of this or for this reason occurs before a proposition, it's actually indicating a conclusion. 
When you look at the whole phrase, because of this, the this is actually referring back to a previously given proposition. The previous proposition is the premise. The new proposition that's being introduced by because of this is the conclusion. Example, all humans are mortal. Socrates is human. Because of this, Socrates is mortal. The this refers back to the preceding premises. Let's think of some further tips to apply in rule one. Rule one is all about identifying the parts of arguments. When we have an argument, we're trying to identify what the conclusion is and what the premises are. But the first thing to keep in mind is not all writing has arguments. Not all writing or speech has arguments. Sometimes you're just reporting information. You're giving advice or a warning. You're trying to get someone to do something. You're asking a question. None of those types of speech count as arguments. If you're giving information, those would count as propositions because you're making claims about the world. One way of understanding a proposition is that it's a representation of reality or the way the world is. Not all language does that. So giving a command, asking a question, you're not asserting propositions, so it's not gonna be an argument. An argument is composed of propositions. In other cases, you are asserting propositions, but you're just reporting information. The sky is blue, space is infinite, whatever. The claims could be true, they could be false. Unless some of your claims are being used as evidence for another claim, there's no argument. And so there's nothing to evaluate in terms of critical thinking or logic. Another tip, not all arguments have indicator words. Sometimes you will have words like therefore or thus for the conclusion and because or sense for premises, but you don't always have that. If there's no indicator words, it doesn't mean there's no argument. Look for the logical relations between the propositions. If some of the propositions can be used as proof of or evidence for another, you probably have an argument. The only exception would be in reports of information where there could be an inferential or logical link between the claims, but the passage of speech or text just isn't doing that. But usually if there's a logical relation between the propositions, you're looking at an argument. Some passages have sentences that are not part of an argument. So sometimes you're looking at a text that is an argument or contains an argument, but there also could be background information or context. How do you tell the difference? If the propositions are not being used to prove anything, then, they, then they're not premises and they don't count as part of an argument. So for example, in the argument about Socrates, if I started out with saying Socrates was an ancient Greek philosopher, that does not help prove the conclusion, at least not unless you make a direct connection between that and another claim. And so it would just be background information, not a premise. Premises and conclusion can be part of the same grammatical sentence. So for example, Socrates, the argument about Socrates, you could say, all humans are mortal, comma, Socrates is a human, comma, therefore Socrates is mortal. You've combined all three propositions into one grammatical sentence, but it still counts as an argument. Typically when we evaluate arguments in critical thinking, we separate out the propositions into separate grammatical sentences just to add clarity. But oftentimes in speech or writing, this is not done. So you need to be able to do that by looking at the logical connections between the different parts of a sentence. Premises or conclusion can also be repeated in a passage. Now this would generally be done for emphasis or clarification. If the exact same proposition is repeated again or maybe sometimes with just slightly different wording, you need to be able to identify that because they could just be a repetition that does not actually show up in your analysis of the argument. For example, the conclusion could be stated at the beginning and stated at the end. Socrates is going to die. All humans are mortal. Socrates is human. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. The first sentence, Socrates is going to die, has the same logical meaning as the second uh, utterance of the conclusion. Socrates is mortal. That's just a repetition. So you don't need to put that twice in your reconstruction of an argument for purposes of evaluation. An argument can have sub conclusions in addition to the main conclusion. So this is the trickiest bit, but basically every argument only has one main conclusion. That's the main point you're trying to prove. Arguments can have more than one logical step though. 
If it has more than one logical step, one of the premises counts as a subconclusion. Subconclusions are still premises. They're a type of premise. The difference between subconclusions and other premises is that subconclusions are proven by uh, previous premises, and then they themselves go on to help prove the conclusion. Example, in the argument about Socrates, if you wanted to prove that Socrates is human, you could say, well, he looks like a human, he eats human food, etc. So that would be a way of turning the second premise, Socrates is human, into a subconclusion. Now, in this particular case, you probably wouldn't need to do that because anyone who knows who Socrates is, it's obvious that he's human. But in other cases, you might need to prove a premise in your argument before it can be taken as proof for the conclusion. This is actually very common. There's no limit to the number of logical steps an argument can have. But keep in mind, there's only one main conclusion of the proposition, only one proposition the argument is trying to prove. If you think you have an argument with more than one main conclusion, you're actually looking at two or more separate arguments, each with its own conclusion. And they could overlap in terms of the premises, but they're still different logical arguments need to be evaluated separately. Aristotle was another ancient Greek philosopher, and he's regarded as the founder of ancient Greek logic because he was the first to identify the types of argument forms or some types of argument forms and evaluate them for being valid or invalid. The valid arguments are ones that give you a reason to believe the conclusion. The invalid ones don't give you a compelling reason. There's actually more precise definitions of those concepts, but that's basically what they mean. So let's look at some sample problems. These are adapted from actual texts or speeches. Racial segregation reduces some persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is morally wrong. So our objective here is to identify the premise and to identify the conclusion. We begin by looking for indicator words. Are there any premise or conclusion indicator words in this passage? The word hence is a conclusion indicator word. So we can put the, the proposition that follows, segregation is morally wrong, uh, in red, symbolizing that it's a conclusion. That leaves the first proposition, racial segregation reduces some persons to the status of things, as our premise. Now, keep in mind that there's only two sentences here, and they express two propositions. We've identified the conclusion, segregation is morally wrong, if this passage is an argument, that means the first sentence has to be a premise. And you can always check this by thinking about the logical meaning of the propositions. Racial segregation reduces some persons to the status of things. Can that be used as proof of or evidence for the claim that segregation is morally wrong? Yes. Now, this is not a valid argument on its own. I'm not saying it's a bad argument. Valid means that if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. It's logically necessary. You can make this argument valid just by adding an additional premise. If racial segregation reduces some persons to the status of things, then segregation is morally wrong. That premise would probably need additional defense of its own, but it's definitely reasonable. We'll talk more about evaluating arguments in a later video. Another sample problem. Professors shouldn't give their students grades on their assignments because grades create bad incentives and they don't provide useful feedback. So once again, we're gonna start by looking for our indicator words. Because is an indicator, it's a premise indicator. That means the proposition that follows, grades create bad incentives and they don't provide useful feedback, are premises. So we're gonna put those in blue. So then what's the conclusion of this argument? It's the first clause. Professors shouldn't give their students grades on their assignments. Now, this is one of those cases where we have a whole argument in one grammatical sentence, and this can totally happen. So oftentimes what will happen is you'll have different clauses. One clause is the conclusion, and the other clause or clauses are the premises, different grammatical clauses, in this case, separated by a comma. By the way, these are not word for word um, arguments. Uh, this one was adapted from Jesse Stommel in the uh, article, Why I Don't Grade. Another sample problem. Some people buy college degrees on the internet because they're trying to pretend that they went to college. That's a waste of money, since it's easy to make a college degree on your computer, and a degree that you make yourself is just as good as a degree that you bought on the internet. 
So do we see any indicator words here? Any thus, therefore, because, and so on? We do have since. So since is a, a premise indicator. So that's going to be an indication that the proposition that follows the sense is a premise. So we put it in blue. It's easy to make a college degree on your computer and a degree that you make yourself is just as good as a degree that you bought on the internet. Now this premise has two logical parts separated by the logical word and. Basically what's going on is there's two separate claims. It's easy to make a college degree on your computer and a degree you make yourself is just as good as the degree you bought on the internet. So those two claims both function as premises because they can both help prove the conclusion. The preceding clause of that sentence, that's a waste of money, is going to be the conclusion of our argument. So what about the first sentence? Some people buy college degrees on the internet because they're trying to pretend they went to college. That's not a part of the argument. It's an example of giving context, context or background information. This can be done just to help clarify what the argument is about. But since that claim does not help prove the conclusion, it's not a premise, so it's not part of the argument. Another sample problem. In order to prosper, a democracy needs its citizens to be able to carry out their responsibilities competently. Being a competent citizen requires familiarity with the basics of math, natural science, social science, history, and literature as well as the ability to read and write well and the ability to think critically. A liberal education is essential to developing these skills. Therefore, in order for a democracy to prosper, its citizens must get a liberal education. And by the way, just for clarification, uh, the author is not necessarily arguing for a liberal education in the political sense of liberal. Liberal education or liberal arts education, uh, it's an old concept. It just means a free or wide ranging education, which is not narrow, but encompasses many topics. So do we have any indicator words in this argument? The answer is yes, the word therefore. So this is gonna be a conclusion indicator word. So we can put the proposition that follows in red. In order for a democracy to prosper, its citizens must get a liberal education. This is the main point of the argument, what it's trying to prove. Once we've identified the conclusion, it should be easier to identify the premises, even though this is a long, somewhat complex passage. If we have a, a proposition uh, part of a sentence or a whole sentence that helps prove that conclusion, then it's going to count as a premise. So we have to look at each of these sentences individually, but it turns out that all of them are premises in the argument. Let's break it down. In order to prosper, a democracy needs its citizens to be able to carry out their responsibilities competently. Why is that a premise? Look at the conclusion, in order for democracy to prosper. Notice the similarity in the concepts, the phrases in order for a democracy to prosper. The conclusion is a claim about what a democracy needs in order to succeed. And this first sentence gives information about that. A democracy needs its citizens to be able to carry out the responsibilities competently. So there's a logical link between that claim and the conclusion. Now, this first sentence does not prove the conclusion directly entirely on its own. It has to work with the other sentences to do that. And when you understand the logical connections between the other sentences, that's how you know they're all premises. Let's look at the next one. Being a competent citizen requires familiarity with the basics of math, science, etc. So this is connected to the first sentence. The first sentence is talking about what you need to be a competent citizen. Or sorry, the first sentence is talking about a democracy needing competent citizens to prosper. And the second sentence is talking about what you need to be a competent citizen. So both of those claims are necessary to help prove the conclusion. They're both logically connected to each other and to the conclusion. Third sentence, a liberal education is essential to developing these skills. So that brings it all together to help prove the conclusion. The conclusion does not mention the familiarity with math, science, etc. It just mentions liberal education. And so that's why we need that third sentence in there as a premise, because collectively then the three sentences can prove the conclusion. Let's look at another sample problem. This is about the celestial object, Oumuamua, which was discovered at an observatory in Hawaii. So it was given the Hawaiian name, which means scout. In October, 2017, astronomers spotted a mysterious object that they named Oumuamua. Not only does Oumuamua originate from outside our solar system, but astronomers have determined that Oumuamua has a strange elongated shape, that it is unusually reflective. 
that it does not have a tail like a comet, and that it sped up after it passed the sun. These features make it unlikely that Oumuamua is an asteroid or a comet. Thus, it is worth considering the possibility that Oumuamua was created by aliens. This was an argument made by an actual uh, physicist or astrophysicist, Abraham Loeb. However, uh, it was since basically debunked when they learned more about the celestial object and what its likely uh, composition was, as well as its origin um, and how it spun. So it can actually be accounted for um, by standard models, but it does originate from outside the solar system. So it was definitely an interesting problem. This also represents an interesting aspect of science is that there are these sort of Hail Mary passes, you could say, in terms of scientific hypotheses. And even though it turns out that Loeb's guess was wrong and he may have just been doing this as a bit of a publicity stunt, I don't mean to slander the guy, but if you read his original piece, um, I mean, he's raising an interesting possibility, but it wasn't especially probable even when we knew less about it. However, this general thing, it doesn't mean it's bad to suggest seemingly outlandish hypotheses. This is a part of how we learn. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's an important principle of critical thinking that you should investigate seemingly outlandish or unlikely possibilities because there's a chance they could pay off, especially if you have a mystery. Um, it doesn't mean you should consider any view, how, no matter how low the probability is, but it's okay to seriously consider and try to be objective when entertaining hypotheses that you might just make fun of or scoff. That's part of being a good critical thinker is try to check your bias a bit. So let's look at this passage and try to analyze it for premises and conclusion. Are there any indicator words? Yes, we have one, thus, and that's going to indicate the conclusion. So we can put the last uh, sentence in red. It is worth considering the possibility that Oumuamua was created by aliens. Now keep in mind that this is a, a problematic argument in its structure because the initial premises basically outline the fact that we don't know what this um, celestial object is. We don't know, um, we can't understand it using our standard models. However, the conclusion is a very specific explanation for that. It doesn't mean the explanation the conclusion is false. It could have been true. But the point is, it has an argument from ignorance structure to it. It's basically saying, look at these facts about Oumuamua. It tells us that we can't account for what it is using our standard assumptions and knowledge of celestial objects. And then it tries to move from that lack of certainty, that lack of information, that lack of knowledge to a particular hypothesis. It must have been created by aliens. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't any aliens out there or that they don't create objects. It's totally possible, physically speaking. But the point is, the basic structure of this argument is not very effective. So now we've identified the conclusion. Let's look for the premises. The first sentence is actually not a premise in the argument. In October 2017, astronomers spotted a mysterious object that they named Oumuamua. Does that help prove the conclusion that Oumuamua was created by aliens? No, it's just giving background or context. So it's not actually part of the argument. It's just helping us understand and interpret what the argument's about. But the next several sentences do count as premises. Not only does Oumuamua originate from outside our solar system, but astronomers have determined that Oumuamua has a strange shape, it's unusually reflective, does not have a tail like a normal comet, and it's sped up after past the sun, unlike the way normal comets behave. And so it's basically saying that it's unlikely that it's an asteroid or comet. It turns out that the composition of Oumuamua is probably icy like a comet, but it has unusual spin and it's from outside the solar system. Uh, those, that's not the full explanation, but it's some of the reasons why um, it's probably not an alien scout or some other object. But those things are premises because they do try to prove the conclusion. This is where critical thinking gets interesting. To a certain extent, logic or critical thinking are objective, cut and dried. You can evaluate logically speaking whether an argument is valid or invalid, for example. That's not subjective or open to interpretation once you understand the rules of logic. However, in order to even know that you're looking at an argument in the first place and what the parts of the argument are, you have to interpret the text to figure out the, in, the uh, intention of the speaker or of the writer. Which propositions are supposed to prove the conclusion? Even if they don't do a good job, you can uh, basically interpret
interpret what the intent is. And in this case, it's pretty clear the second and third sentences of this passage are attempting to prove the conclusion. So they count as premises in the argument. A final sample problem. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau looks suspiciously like former Cuban leader Fidel Castro. Trudeau's parents traveled to Cuba many times and met with Castro. And there are pictures of Trudeau's mother looking fondly at Castro. Is it too far-fetched to believe that Fidel Castro is Justin Trudeau's real father? So it turns out this is uh, not true. It was disproven by, if you look at the dates when the Trudeaus visited Cuba, it does not align up with when Justin Trudeau could have been conceived. So sorry to burst the bubble, but it's still a fun, interesting argument to look at. So let's look for the conclusion. Are there any indicator words? We have this whole clause. Is it too far-fetched to believe that? This is an unusual conclusion, in, conclusion indicator phrase, but it shows you the variety that's possible for indicator words. Language, all natural languages, including English and other languages that were developed by humans uh, as for everyday communication, they have enormous flexibility. So there isn't like a, a finite set of conclusion indicator words or phrases that we can identify and say, okay, whenever you see one of these, it's gonna be an indicator. No, language is more flexible than that. This is a perfect example. This whole phrase, is it too far-fetched to believe that? It's basically suggesting the conclusion that Fidel Castro is Justin Trudeau's real father. Also notice this last sentence ends in a question mark. Usually questions are not propositions and therefore not parts of arguments. However, you can have rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions are actually asserting a proposition, but are put in question form to elicit the attention or interest of an audience. And also in this case, the question is sort of softening the conclusion by just trying to float it as a suggestion without saying we can definitively prove. By the way, sometimes that's a rhetorical tactic used by people who know they don't have good evidence for their conclusion, but they're just trying to implant it as a suggestion in people's minds. So now that we have that indicator word, uh, the indicator phrase, we can identify the conclusion. Fidel Castro is Trudeau's real father. And this conclusion will help us identify what the premises are. If we look at each of the sentences that precede the conclusion, they all do help prove that conclusion. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau looks suspiciously like former Cuban leader Fidel Castro. Uh, this side-by-side uh, -side picture I have on the slide does show that they have some resemblances, but you know, look at their chin, different, their eyebrows are somewhat different, eyes different, etc. cetera. Uh, the second sentence, Trudeau's parents traveled to Cuba many times and met with Castro, and there are pictures of Trudeau's mother looking fondly at Castro. So yeah, this counts as the premise because it's trying to help prove that conclusion. That's it for rule one. Next up is rule two, unfold your ideas in a natural order which is about how to present an argument into standard logical form.